Hey guys, Britt here. Welcome to End Times Bible Prophecy. Make sure to hit the subscribe, like, and share buttons. Well, you've been warned. Make sure you're prepared. What am I talking about? Well, we'll talk about that just in just a second. I want to take a look at this first right here. So if you haven't had a chance to go over to the Substack at brittgillette.substack.com, you probably missed this article from late last week, Seven Reasons You Should Study Bible Prophecy, How God's Promises Can Enrich Your Life. So if you missed that, I'll put a link to that in the description, pin it at the top of the comments. You can go check that out. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, I've been receiving more and more uh, comments and emails from people about the comments section and imposter comments showing up on YouTube. So make sure to check out. A lot of times they'll take my picture, pair it with some account that has all the same letters that mine does, but they'll add an extra letter or number. And then they'll pretend to be me and say, you know, send me cash at this account. Whenever I see those, I immediately delete those. YouTube usually does a good job of uh, filtering those out and deleting those before I even get a chance to see them. But lately, it seems like those have been staying up longer than they should. So just beware of those. I'm not going to ask you to send me money in the comments. On YouTube. So if that's happening, that's one indication immediately that it is not me. But I want to make sure everybody's aware of that so that nobody falls victim to anything like that. So back to our video. You've been warned. Make sure you're prepared. What am I talking about? I'm talking about, well, this right here. This is from Zero Hedge. This has to do with an event that took place on Friday. It says, bank failures begin again. Phillies Republic First seized by the FDIC. And it says, admittedly, we were a couple of weeks off. But trouble has been brewing in the banking sector. And tonight, after the close, we get the first bank failure of the year. And guys, they I think Zero Hedge has been calling for this banking crisis to reemerge. Got to forgive my voice, I'm getting sick. <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't impact the rest of the week's videos, but um, I may be losing my voice in the middle of this. I thought this banking crisis would reemerge in March. So if you've been watching this channel, you know we've been talking about that. I'm surprised that we've made it this far, but guys, just because it's been delayed does not mean it's been canceled. Everything we talked about before is still in line to happen. So we need to be prepared. Notice, now this is a small bank. This is not some resounding, earth-shattering global event. This one bank failing. But notice, after the close, and this was a Friday article that we're looking at right now. So what have I been saying for two years now, it'll come on a Friday, right? They wait, they wait for Friday, so they have the weekend to take care of all these things and start to put things in order again. It says the FDIC just seized the trouble, f- troubled Philadelphia bank, Republic First Bancor, and struck an agreement for the lender's deposits and the majority of its assets to be bought by Fulton Bank. So it's being acquired these Republic Bank branches will become Fulton Bank branches, or actually they did over the weekend because that happened on Saturday. It says, Republic Bank had about $6 billion of assets and $4 billion of deposits at the end of January, according to the FDIC, considerably smaller than the one to $200 billion in assets with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, which those failed in 2023. Again, two of the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in U.S. history. It says the FDIC estimated the failure will cost the deposit insurance fund $667 million. So that means $667 million in deposits were at that bank uninsured, 
insured. Uh, well, I <laughs> take that back. They are insured. It's going to cost them that. But there's more that were there. It's believed that were uninsured. So it says, as the Wall Street Journal reports, first Republic First had for months struggled to stay afloat. Around half its deposits were uninsured at the end of 2023. So if that held true going into Friday, then it's true. Like if they're saying half weren't insured and half were, and it cost $667 million for the FDIC to bail out those insured deposits, then that I take that to mean that $667 million in deposits were uninsured if those deposits were still at the bank on Friday. It says its total equity or assets minus liabilities was $96 million at the end of 2023. And guys, this is key to understanding why this crisis isn't going away and this is a there is a major crisis brewing it says that excluded 262 million dollars of unrealized losses on bonds that it labeled held to maturity this is what we've been talking about with these banks that are underwater which means the losses hadn't counted on its balance sheet so this is basically because of the United States government, the Federal Reserve, the central bankers have put these regulations in place that allow them to count these assets at full face value instead of as the uh, uh, their current value, their actual value. So let's say, you know, for instance, <laughs> Donald Trump was just taken to court in New York over this very idea that well, he inflated the value of his properties in order to get loans, and they called that a fraud. Well, here, they're allowing banks to count these assets as worth more than what they actually are, which is fraud. So we know what the market pays for these assets. There's no dispute over it. It would be as if we bought you know, a $500,000 house and then the market crashes and it's a $250,000 house, but we still claimed it was worth 500,000. And let's say we have 400,000 on it, right? And we're saying, oh, we're, we've got $100,000 in equity in this house because we bought it for 500,000. We have 400,000 on it. But in reality, all we could sell it for was two hundred fifty. That means we're one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the negative. If we sold it, we would we wouldn't be able to pay off that loan. That means, well, that's underwater. That's called being underwater. That's what these banks are. So, this bank was saying it was had ninety six million in equity, but it wasn't counting two hundred sixty two million dollars in losses. That's, a, that's just outrageous, guys. It says the stock, which was delisted from NASDAQ in August, had been near zero. And I have to ask, why at the end of the year were half its deposits uninsured? If it had been delisted from NASDAQ and was a penny stock, wouldn't that be an indication if you had your cash at this bank? Hey, uh, you know, maybe there's some problems at this bank and I'll pull out the uninsured deposits, but... I guess not. I don't know who those people are. But it says, you should not be surprised given that rates are higher now than they were at the start of the Silicon Valley bank crisis, which means unless banks have hedged hard or dumped their bonds at a loss, they're even more underwater. Because here we see this chart of the unrealized losses at banks. It's much higher than this right now. This is, I believe, as of December 31st, where they stand again. I want to point out, this was the great financial crisis right here. That little tiny blip. This is where we've stood for, for a year now. It says, add to this the fact that last week, seasonally adjusted for tax season, U.S. banks saw the largest deposit outflows since 9-11. Yes, that 9-11. So let's take a bigger look at this chart here. 
Here's our deposit outflows last week. We go back to March of last year. That's the Silicon Valley and the banking, the emergence of the banking crisis last year. Not really sure what this blip is, but this would be COVID. This would be the great financial crisis, probably the failure of Lehman Brothers. And here's 9-11. So guys, this, this is not a positive indicator of bank health. It says, and as we showed earlier, absent the $126 billion outstanding in the Fed's bank term funding bailout fund, which is now terminated and slowly running down as the term matures, the banking crisis is back. And now the question is, who's next? And guys, I don't know how quickly we'll see the next bank failures emerge. Again, this was a small bank in the scheme of things, especially compared to the bank failures we saw last year. But I believe that it's a canary in the coal mine indicator of what is in the immediate future. So that article mentioned the bank term funding program. Let's pull that back up. As we've noted in the past, if you're new to the channel, this program was put in place. It did not exist until March of 2023 when they rolled this out basically to save the banking system from catastrophic failure on a global scale because we had the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in U.S. history. We had the failure of Credit Suisse, which was forced into be, to be acquired by UBS at the time. Now UBS is having problems because they've had to absorb all the, the terrible balance sheet of Credit Suisse. That's a global, systemically important bank that would cause a contagion impact to the global financial system. So they rolled this program out. They had... 79 billion in loans taken out in the first few weeks. These loans were termed for one year, then they must be paid back with interest. And as we noted, the, we saw these going up later in the year. Well, based on what we see here by April 5th, and we're now at the end of April, 79 billion of these loans should have been paid back. But instead we see the peak was 167.7 billion. We're at 125 still on there. So half of that, a little more than half of that 79 billion has been paid back. How is that? <laughs> well, there's there's only two two things that could be going on, and both involve shenanigans by the central bankers. One, well, they simply lied to us, right? That's certainly a possibility, one I would put a high probability on, and that they said, well, we know you told us it was a year that you had to pay us back, but let's make it, we really meant 10, you know? So they could, they could totally change the terms. Or B, here, what we saw a lot of here was uh, banks turning around paying off these loans they took out back here, and then turning around and taking out new loans immediately, so they extended the term an additional year from when they did that. I don't know, there's been no explanation as to why this has not fallen more than it has, plain and simple. But guys, the problems with the banking system are still there. They mentioned interest rates in that zero hedge article. Let's take a look at the 10-year U.S. Treasury. So this is debt. People give cash to the U.S. government. The U.S. government hands over this piece of paper that says, we'll pay you back over the course of 10 years at this rate. 4.66% is where it trades at right now. This is considered a benchmark for interest rates in the United States. And as we can see, they hit a high of just a little over 4.09% 4 right before we saw the banking crisis of last year. So we're much higher than that. 
Now you might note that we went higher than that. Back in late October, it actually hit 5% very briefly before we had a sell-off. Keep in mind, if you were watching this channel back then, we noted all of the series of coincidences that took place <laughs> throughout October and into early November, where we had, oh, well, uh, you know, there's a glitch in the system. Uh, 12 Japanese banks, all, for whatever reason, couldn't, uh, couldn't make the, you know, none of the deposits settled, none of the accounts settled for, I don't know, six days, something like that, <laughs> till the glitch was, was figured out. Then a week or two later, we had Wells Fargo, Bank, Amer Bank of America, JP Morgan, the largest banks in the United States, all of a sudden they had problems. Oh, we're having problems uh, processing transactions. It's a glitch, right? It's a software glitch. <laughs> and all of these software glitches went on. We had uh, treasury auction problems. They claimed, oh, it's, it was a ransomware attack. We had another glitch and somebody had to run down a street in New York holding a, a flash drive that had <laughs> the proper information on it. They gave all these excuses. If you remember, Jerome Powell came out and started talking about all of a sudden, well, interest, we're going to lower interest rates, right? And of course, all of that talk, along with the issues we were seeing, made the interest rates fall, which helped these banks because now they were, they didn't have the unrealized losses to the scale they had up here. But now we're seeing that creep back up as people realize, well, Pal lied to us, right? He told, he told us, oh, yeah, we're looking at, I think they had seven rate cuts priced in for 2024. Now we're at a point where the market's thinking, well, maybe there's one in December. I'm going to go out on a limb and say there's going to be seven this year, probably all at once from the catastrophic crisis that's going to unfold. <laughs> when exactly that happens, what day that happens, I have no idea. But when it does, when it begins to happen, we will know that it's happening when we see this indicator. We've talked about this before. The U.S. two-year, 10-year spread. Right now it's negative. When it's negative, that's called an inverted yield curve. Going back decades on end, inverted yield curves have preceded recessions 100% of the time. The track record is perfect going back decades. And in this moder modern monetary system, post-1971, it's absolutely perfect track record. We have no reason to believe this won't be the case this time. The yield curve's been inverted for almost two years at this point, meaning it's been below this zero Low zero since 2022. So June, July, June or July 2022. Can't remember which one. We're coming up on two years. But to my knowledge, that's the longest inverted yield curve in U.S. history. That doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be the most catastrophic recession in U.S. history. But that might be a coincidence, too. We'll see. We'll see. But when we see this go positive, if you watch this number, and I look at this every day, once this goes positive, and I believe that it will go positive very suddenly, so this isn't going to creep up a you know, hundredth of a point at a time. It's going to happen very fast, most likely as a result of a crisis, whether that's in the banks or, as we've mentioned before, there's some problems going on in Japan with the that could be leading to a currency crisis as we speak. I'm paying attention to that. If necessary, I'll do a video on that. But guys, once once that crisis emerges, this will quickly go positive, and most likely we'll see stock markets around the world in crash mode. We'll see those interest rates. We'll see the banks try to cut interest rates. The, the key thing to look for is when they do that, will the market listen, right? Because <laughs> they can say, 
all they want. Well, interest rates are now 1%, but if the market says, no, nope, I think they're 10 <laughs> because you're, you're just printing all of this, uh, these pieces of paper, creating these ones and zeros. I don't know that we want that. Or 1% is not sufficient for us to loan you this cash. You need to pay us more. If that happens, well, the wheels completely come off the bus and we have, we're in uncharted territory, guys. And I have a, I think there's a better uh, than even odds probability that that is going to happen. But guys, when that happens, when we start to see these bank this bank crisis reemerged to the degree we saw last year. We very well could be looking at credit markets freezing around the world. We've had we've come very close to this happening in the past. We had this happen with uh, long-term capital management back in 1998. Many people believe we we're about a day away from credit markets freezing around the globe. Following the failure of Lehman Brothers, many people believe we're hours away from the credit markets freezing around the globe. Then in late 2019, there were some issues that people thought could have led to that, but the Fed was able to paper over that. Who knows that they can do that this time, but if they cannot, if we see the credit markets freeze, you will see this. A bank holiday. We last saw this in the United States back in March 1933 in the depths of the Great Depression. It says for the entire week in March 1933, all banking transactions were suspended in an effort to stem bank failures and ultimately restore confidence in the financial system. Guys, again, this crisis has been delayed. I thought it would be here by now. It has been delayed. That does not mean that it has been canceled. That should, that's a good thing, right? Because we certainly don't want this to happen because it's still coming. But it's a good thing, even if it's still going to come anyway, that it's been delayed. That gives us better time to prepare. Again, if there's a credit event and a bank holiday... That means for two to three weeks, I don't know how long, we're going to have a, a frozen banking system, frozen credit markets. That means everything's going to come to a stop in very short order. If you remember what the world was like in late March, early April 2020, when you would go to a store, maybe they don't have what you're looking for. That's the type of thing we're talking about here. Deliveries to gas stations, deliveries to grocery stores and restaurants will stop because the credit won't be available to the businesses to continue producing those goods, shipping those goods, and doing all of the economic activity that we count on because the basically the, the oil that runs that financial system will be gone for a moment. It will be frozen until they restore confidence. So that means most likely the gas station runs out of gas, the grocery store and the restaurants run out of food. Make sure you're prepared for that. Doesn't mean that you have to have 10 years of food stored up. But make sure you have a deep pantry. If you count on, if you have nothing in your pantry and you go to the grocery store or a restaurant every day to eat, it's a bad idea because you may go tomorrow and there's nothing there. So make sure that you have a few weeks of provisions set aside. Make sure you have a full tank of gas every Friday. This past Friday, we didn't see the banking system seize up. We saw the small bank failure. But one day, one Friday, notice how they, again, they did it on a Friday, just as we've been saying, one Friday, it will. And guys, why does all of this matter to Bible prophecy? How does this fit into this? Well, this I believe this is going to be a catastrophic financial crisis in our very near future. Worse than the Great Depression, not as long, but maybe even hyperinflation on the other side. It's a collapse of the global monetary system, as we talked about with the Ponzi scheme video last week. 
This is going to be a global event. And they, they're going to have to roll out something, just as it says in this bank holiday, to restore confidence in the financial system. I'm pretty certain that that's why they're getting everything in place right now for central bank digital currencies and digital IDs. They're going to try to corral the entire world into that system. They're going to try to they're going to use fear. They're going to use incentives, rewards and punishments in order to push people into that system, because, again, all of this was set in line. A lot of people, they'll, they'll say in the comments, was well, this planned? Is this just nobody is in control? It's a little, little bit of both. Some of these people in charge are just absolutely clueless. Some people know what's going to happen, and they're building plans to maintain their control. Again, the plans to do this were not put in place by anybody today because all of this was set in motion long before any of these people were alive. This has been a long process that's been going on really since World War I. This is just the natural order of how this system would play out, especially following 1971 and when Nixon ended Bretton Woods and the Bretton Woods Agreement. So this has been in motion. They're, that's why they're trying to hold this back. And, and they will try to hold it back as long as they can, guys, because they have power now. Once it unravels, they have plans that they want to put in place to maintain power, but they can't be certain that they will. That's why they're trying to hold it off as long as they can. That's why all these bailouts continually happen. These programs prop up. They're putting Band-Aids everywhere. They're putting their finger in the leak in the boat everywhere they can. But you can only do that for so long before it falls apart. When it falls apart, their plan is to corral the world into central bank digital currencies. Again, I want to continuously look at this. Not everybody watches all these videos, but this is from the Atlantic Council website and their central bank digital currency tracker. And if we go in and look at this, they are they have plans in place to get the whole globe under these central bank digital currencies. We see three have already been launched. Nigeria, Senegal, Bahamas, Jamaica, Ecuador, two, well, two have been canceled. So Ecuador was canceled. Nigeria has been launched. Senegal and Ecuador were canceled were canceled, but these three have been launched. They have 36 pilot programs, 30 development programs, 44 research programs. So they're rolling all this stuff out, guys. Look at how much of the world this covers that are in development or pilot programs. This is what they want to do. They want to move us all into that system, but they need a crisis to force people to do it. And they know that crisis is coming. And when it does, there's going to be a full court press propaganda campaign to convince you and everybody around you that the way out of the crisis is to go digital and to force people to set up digital IDs and to use central bank digital currency, just as we saw last four years, how they tried to force people to do other things against their will. Guys, all of this is going to be setting the stage. All of, all of what's going on right here is setting the stage for the Mark of the Beast system. As we read about in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 through 17, he, meaning the Antichrist, required everyone, small and great, Rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead, and no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. So the Antichrist, the false prophet, they're going to roll out this system in the tribulation period, and anyone who doesn't comply with it, well, they won't be able to buy or sell at all. We're seeing that system put in place right now. 
It won't just appear in the middle of the tribulation. It will already exist in function. The ability to do all of this, what we read about in Revelation 13, will already be there. They'll just need to be able to turn it on. And we're seeing those systems put in place right now, guys. I believe this financial crisis that's coming, the global depression that's coming, the banking crisis that could reemerge at any moment is going to be the crisis they use to push everybody into this system that at some point in the future during the tribulation will become the mark of the beast system. So guys, that's why we talk about this all the time. It is because we are in that moment financially to see all of this unravel. Make sure you're preparing. The Bible says we should diversify. The Bible says we should prepare when we see danger coming. We should take prudent action to protect ourselves and those around us. So make sure you're taking whatever steps you can to prepare because once all of this happens, it'll be too late. If you haven't prepared, well, you're going to be hoping that the people around you have. If the grocery store and the restaurants have no food, as the credit markets are frozen, the financial systems shut down, I would rather be in the position of being able to help those around me rather than hoping, <laughs> you know, rather than saying, I wish I had listened when I was told to prepare. Make sure you're prepared, guys. So let me know what you think. Leave your comments below. Again, look out for those fake spammy comments. They should be removed, but they still are popping up here and there. So I'm never going to ask you for money, right? So if you see that in the comments, that's a red flag right there. So be aware of that. But leave your comments below. Make sure to hit the like, share, and subscribe buttons. God willing, I will see you on Wednesday. Bye. If you want to learn more about the end times and Bible prophecy, make sure to visit my Substack at brittgillette.substack.com. There you'll find my latest videos and articles, as well as notes, where I share the latest news headlines, the articles I'm reading, and the videos I'm watching. Subscribe for free, and each new post on Substack will be sent directly to your email. Just scroll to the bottom of the homepage and hit the subscribe button. As an added bonus, your first welcome email will include a link to a copy of my free ebook, Seven Signs of the End Times. Also, make sure to check out all of my books. Just look up Brit Gillette on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple iBooks, Google Books, Kobo, or anywhere books are sold. Thanks for watching today, and until next time, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith.